Our planet was formed about 4.5 billion years ago. However, humans or Homo sapiens have only been here for about 200,000 years. If we were to shrink all history of Earth in one year, modern humans have only been here for the last 30 minutes. However, it's in this brief time frame in which humans have been able to develop languages, science, philosophy, all the fine arts. And it's also in the field of medicine in which humans have also been able to make big advances. All records of ancient civilizations show that one way or another, our ancestors were in touch with plants and minerals to make remedies and cures for all sorts of ailments and afflictions. All these forms of medicine were passed down through generations and refined through the centuries. And whereas all traditional forms of medicine differ from each other slightly, there's always a few similarities between them. However, the aspect that amazed me the most, and the whole reason I decided to jump and dive into this topic, is that common denominator, that mysterious concept that you can find in every traditional medicine system throughout history. Ancient civilizations were usually separated by vast geographical and chronological distances, so it's fair to say that most of them remained unaware and non-influenced by each other. And yet, they all have this concept. The ancient Chinese called it Qi, the Japanese called it Qi, the Indian called it Prana, the Mayan called it Chulel, the Egyptians called it Sekem, and more recently, in the 20th century, it was called Orgone by a prominent psychoanalyst. Time passed and today it's almost impossible for you to remain isolated. All societies, one way or another, influence each other. However, this concept is still there and is widely used in the world of traditional alternative medicine. Today it's called vital force. But what exactly is this concept? What exactly is this entity that has been there for eons? What exactly is the vital force? What? Oh, that is a difficult one to start off with. What is the vital force? Well, I think, I think that's definitely something that is different for every person. But the one way that I try and explain it to patients and to students is imagine that the, imagine or using the analogy of an engine. So an engine is, you know, it has its uh, it's housing, it's got all of its camshafts, it's, it's an actual physical thing. And however, it's going to stay this immobile physical thing without petrol. So the petrol that goes into it that actually animates the, the structure. And I think that's a lot to do with us, is that you look at us, we are just made up of large amounts of water, large amounts of different minerals, calcium, uh, different, you know, uh, hormones and all sorts of different structures, but without the vital force, it wouldn't be animated. The vital force is an intangible thing, really, but w without it, you're dead. And Hahnemann said that, said that quite clearly in the organon, that you take away the vital force, that's, that's the life gone. Because you can, you, can, you can get all the body parts that you need to make up a human being and slap them together, and it's nothing there. Oh, vital force is the, I guess, the energy that infuses all living things. It is a, it's a subtle energy force. Um, it's not something that we have yet got the instruments that clearly measures very well. Um, but that's not to say it's not there, it's just because it hasn't been measured very well. Even from a biochemical point of view or a biological point of view that, that creates that connection, that synergy between cells and allows them to coordinate together and all of that kind of stuff. That's, that's the vital force. So to the ancient alchemists, they looked at things in, in that kind of way, which was the, you had the physical body, you had the uh, life force or the vital force that animates the physical body. And then within uh, those two, you've got the soul or the consciousness, which um, you know, to, to many uh, people of different faiths and things like that, they believe that that is immortal. Um, but basically when the vital force leaves the body, that's when death occurs. So the vital force is, is something that can change, it can uh, change with the environment that you're working in, 
Uh, people often talk about going into um, you know, office buildings and things like that with lots of lighting and air conditioning and it's, it lacks vitality, it lacks uh, that connection with the natural world and that's really what feeds and supplies that, um, that vital force. So I think, yeah, it's, it's life force, it's, it is life. It's something really ethereal and translucent and subtle, really subtle. I suppose vital force is that innate internal regulatory force which drives our spirit, our body and our emotions and mental functioning. It's, it's feeling good, it's looking good, it's when people say to you, you know, you look really well, you exude wellness and, you know, everything's 10 out of 10. So when we use the concept of vital force, this is a word that's synonymous with uh, the term vitality or energy or spirit. And it's known um, by different um, modalities as, for example, Chinese medicine uses the term qi to describe something like vital force. In Ayurvedic medicine, they use the word prana. So it's basically just a uh, life itself or, or this, this term of energy. I, I really, it, it's very hard to put into words because it, it, the problem with putting it into words is that I feel that somehow that devalues it because words don't really do it justice. That's what, you know, when they say that term, he gave up the ghost, you know, the, 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 the force, the vital force that animated the body had left and therefore the body had died. So I think that vitality um, is not something that is in today's modern society it, with modern science and all the amazing things that come with it it's not something that can be quantified as yet but it's still there just because you can't prove it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist have you ever been in the presence of someone who's died you, you know that the, the room that everything changes at that exact moment and and it's like something you know something has to has gone that was there before but and that's what the vital force is there's so many, you know, sort of slightly different definitions of it, but essentially I suppose I would come back to our body's innate want to function in a homeostatic way. So to bring itself back to balance. And I mean, you can, you can read the organon and it explains it in this really appallingly bad English, but, but huge uh, explanation on what the vital force is. This is this, this, this thing of animation. But all the traditional therapies use that kind of underpinning philosophy as, you know, like this chi and prana, innate intelligence, that sort of stuff. It's the place that you're in. It's the, it's the state of mind you're in. And another way I can explain it to you is the, you have a person who comes to you with an illness. You know, you ask them and you ask their emotions. How do they feel about it? Oh, God, I don't know. It's just so bad. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do, and I'm going to take this drug, and yeah, this is it. Their vitality is low. Their energy, their chi, their state of being, their mental awareness of the capability of how amazing their body is, is not there. It's down. It's flat, right? And this is where natural medicine or naturopaths specifically will actually hone in on the state of a person's vitality based on how they are responding or what they're thinking of or where they're planning their future to be and start building that up. Because when you work in that domain, in the state of mind and their emotional connection to the condition, you can get better results. In homeopathy, what you're doing is you stimulate the vital force. And the vital force is the thing that's most to, supposed to maintain equilibrium in the body, you know, homeostasis. And so when, when the body gets sick, when it's assaulted by morbific stimuli, it tends to, there, there's this expression of, of symptoms. So what you do is you, you encourage the vital force or you stimulate the vital force to restore balance again. Because every illness has a frequency 
every thought has a frequency every aspect about a living thing as such you know everything has a form of frequency and it can either be in a favorable form as such or an unfavorable form so when it's favorable like love laughter joy children sunshine that's all a high frequency and that is what actually raises a person's vitality think of it a bit like a pendulum right if you can imagine a pendulum that gets stuck in certain positions when you're really sick it's stuck all the way up here but what you want it to be is in the middle at the point of balance because you don't want to overstimulate so what what the homeopathy does is it it nudges it the pendulum it doesn't if, if you whack it really hard with a drug for instance it goes all the way up to the other end and you get the drug expressions the adverse effects and all the other things associated with that and that may cause it to go back again to the other side once the drug wears off. Homeopathy is a nudge, it nudges, it, it, it tweaks, it pushes, and it's subtle, and it moves it down. And the, the real art of homeopathy, you can select a remedy easily enough if you know the remedies well, but the art is working out how much of the remedy you give because you, you all you want is enough to affect the change, enough to stimulate the vital force without overstimulating it and you can't define that absolutely because it's different for everybody so you you there's intuition there's there's experience there's a whole range of different things come into it and you prescribe it and lo and behold it works it's very bizarre through the 200,000 years in which humans have been on this planet the landscape of the Earth hasn't changed that much. Even in the last thousand years, you could argue that nothing much really happened. However, this is no longer true in the 20th century. In the last hundred years, profound changes have taken place to our planet and civilization. The world became a much smaller place and human population increased dramatically. In 1910, there were 1.6 billion humans on this planet. Today, the number is close to 7 billion. In 1903, the Wright brothers made the first ever human flight in history. Then in 1969, a mere 66 years later, Neil Armstrong was walking on the moon. The computer that guided Armstrong's spaceship, the Apollo Guidance Computer, was a feat of technology and engineering back in its time. However, today, your mobile phone, perhaps even your digital watch, is many million times more powerful and faster. Someone who lived through the 20th century witnessed, by far, more changes than people born during all other historic periods of time combined. And as counterintuitive as it might sound to some, the way in which we have interacted and changed our planet is not really through the development of cities and skyscrapers and roads and railways, but through our food industry. The expansion of modern farms and livestock production have been a key factor in the devastation and the deforestation of millions and millions of acres of rainforest every year. Monocultures and cattle farming have also rapidly led to the erosion and use up of huge portions of soil, rendering the land sterile and useless for the next thousand years. But not only the earth is struggling to catch up with these violent changes and non-sustainable practices, our own bodies are also having a hard time dealing with this modern food that also has changed a lot in the last hundred years. This documentary has been filmed in the beautiful Australia, a country that recently overtook the United States in obesity per capita. Today Australia is the fattest country in the world. How did that happen? It's a tragedy. I mean, when we look at, and, and I think it boils back to the modern age that we live in, nothing more or less. Uh, people now don't exercise as much as we used to. I mean, if we go back to our Paleolithic cousins, you know, they, or, or, or cavemen, they, they, they used to be foragers, they used to be hunter-gatherers, they used to be running around for most of the day, collecting as much as they could to eat, which had a fairly dense calorific um, uh, output. Uh, so fruits and berries and things like that, the occasional pig or goat or whatever they could 
uh, you know, could get. And then in the meantime, they'd be running like crazy away from dinosaurs or whatever it might have been, um, you know, a saber-toothed tiger here or there, exerting a lot of energy. They worked out all the time. You know, they exercised all the time. You, you consider that evolution to where we are now, which is we sit in armchairs. We, we, we sit at desks all day. From the moment that we wake up, you're programmed to just brush your teeth, have breakfast, go to work. And you'll stay at work for your 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, however many hours it is for, for which particular job that we have today. And what are you doing? You're sitting down, you know? And you might get your lunch break and you can go sit outside for a bit of a walk. But we are, we're, we're being conditioned now to, to just be more sedate, to, to, to relax more because we're so stressed in the life that we have. We work so much. In many cases, people are working six, sometimes seven days a week. Um, and you, you would think, wow, using all that energy, thinking and, and, and working at a desk, let's be honest, guys, it, it's not like going to the gym. It's not like going for a walk. You know, it's that simple. Is that it's, 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 not, it's not just, you know, the, the, the basic dietetic equation of calories in versus calories out. It's not that. There's, there's a lot of other mitigating factors. There's stress. Stress is a huge uh, part here because of its ability to, you know, muck with cortisol levels and all these type of things. But, you know, look at the kids. I look at the kids today, not many play sports. I remember when I was a kid, you really didn't get a choice. You went to school, you played sport, that was it. And you played a sport every, every season per se. So you'd have summer sports and winter sports. Now, well, you know, kids don't have to, they can do computer club or they can be in a chess club and all these other things. We're actually stopping our kids from getting the exercise that they need. But that's all together, you know, that's something that people need to be responsible for themselves. Now we start looking about the food. The food that we're actually producing here is completely different. It's completely the opposite of nature. It's the antithesis of it. It's, it, it's so diametrically opposed to what is natural. Um, the foods that now line our supermarket shelves. They are so nutrient dense that, you know, for some cases you could, you could eat a hamburger and need to be on a treadmill for an hour and a half to work it off. I mean, that's not what we need, but that's what's there. So we look at this, this modern evolution, you know, we talked about the evolution of medicine and how fantastic it is. We now look at the evolution of agriculture and how, you know, mass uh, agriculture now can produce large amounts of grains and all sorts of different foods, food technology now and how far that's coming. But is it for our betterment? Or I don't really think, I don't think so. I mean, it's cheaper now for someone to go and get a Happy Meal than it is to eat a stir fry. How is that normal? How is it normal? I mean, we look at a lot of these uh, fast foods today. Um, they're cheap because of mass uh, agriculture. So they can be, and, and the buying power of the company, of the corporation, uh, so that they can produce these foods very, very cheaply. So they're appealing to uh, most demographics. They're appealing to people that are on the go, that, that just want to grab something and run, that don't want to take the time to prepare their own food. Um, and, you know, I think that that's sad that, the, that this is what we're seeing in modern culture. We're seeing the deprivation um, of our basic rights you know, to, to healthy food. Those kind of foods that are not um, pesticide free, herbicide free, they're not, you know, organic and so forth or free range, the toxins in that reside in our cells. They cause the chronic conditions that you mentioned earlier on. You know, they, they are, and that's why our cancer rate is as high and leading. You know, we're number one in obesity, wow, we beat America. When did we think that was ever gonna happen? But we did, we are number one in the obesity, you know, ranking, uh, not to mention the arthritic conditions. It's a sad state of the times. Obesity and the diabetic, uh, you know, the diabetes uh, epidemic that we're currently seeing at the world. Why has it happened now? That's all you've got to do, you know. If, if you want to understand anything, question its beginning. Question when it started, that's what Aristotle said. So go back and look at this and say, well, it's only been in the last 15 years. What's changed then? Our food supply has changed. That's what's changed. Our ability to have access to all of these cheaper foods and things like that has changed. Our, our uh, identity with work has changed. 
you know, we don't just do the, the nine to five anymore. People work longer hours, they work harder, uh, all this time. They don't have time to go to the gym. They don't have time to go kick the footy with their son. Look, diabetes, uh, obesity, there are scientists out there that will suggest to you that it's genetic, okay? And they can, they can find markers and, 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 and genes to, to prove all this and that's all wonderful. But if that's the case, why has it only been in the last 20 years? I don't know. I stay by what I think and that is it's environmental. So as we look at all of these changes to, to our work, um, to this sedentary lifestyle that we basically lead now, and to the, the food supply. It's affecting our, our health probably more than we know. But you know, the high refined carbohydrate, high preservative, high fat, as well as the high sodium content in a lot of fast food um, is killing people as we speak. So people are getting fatter from the trans fats and the refined carbs. Their teeth are rotting from the sugars they put in the burgers and the breads. Their cholesterol rates are going up with the trans fats that their body doesn't know what to do with. Their waistlines are growing. You know, this stuff's almost addictive. The salt is oxidizing their arteries. It's, it's rubbish. My grandfather used to say, um, that's killing people, that food. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, that bread and those buns sits in your gut. Roll it up in a ball. And he showed me, he rolled one up in a ball. I don't know where we were, someone was eating McDonald's. And he rolled it up and he said, what is that? And it was like a, a ball of flour. And he said, that sits in your gut. And we thought he was all mad at the time because we were little kids. And, but he was right, you know. I don't know whether I'm making it too simple, but I think it's our obsession with sugar. Um, sugar is just so amazingly ubiquitous. Everything is loaded with sugar. Um, you know, and we see sugar in a very positive way. Um, as in, it, it's quite common for people to, you know, say, oh, you know, I need a sugar hit and that somehow be seen as a positive thing that yes, you'll feel better by having a sugar hit. Um, however, without, without really acknowledging that that's going to put a very large stress on our body because our body doesn't like having a high blood sugar level. It does whatever it can, a part, again, part of this homeostatic process to bring that blood sugar level down as quickly as possible. And so, of course, that then drops your blood sugar down into your boots. So then you go, oh, I need another one. So very quickly, people finish up on this sugar merry-go-round, which just feeds itself. Um, and there are so many chronic conditions, that obesity being one of them, that is driven by sugar. Sugar, I think, is incredibly related to obesity. So, and we just, we can't seem to get enough of of the Americanization of our diet. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it just totally flabbergasts me that, you know, that we, from a, from, a, um, <clears throat> from, a, from a government point of view, that the government seems to think that any, any small business is good, is, is good. So it doesn't matter that, you know, you might be starting up a, a, a business which your whole, the whole business premise is to sell sugar and fat and wheat, um, of which we clearly have way too much of. But um, that could be your whole business premise. To me, it's just bizarre that that is seen as being a positive. <clears throat> that it's positive because someone's opening a new business. It doesn't matter the fact that they're opening a new business, which is actually um, a ghastly business doesn't seem to matter. So I find that fascinating. And then on the other hand, the, the, the government's going, oh my goodness, look how everyone's getting so fat. What a surprise, you know? Um, okay, so perhaps if you don't encourage us to follow this whole Americanization of um, more and more fat, perhaps we might not follow the American trend of becoming incredibly obese.
I don't know. But to me, that seems they seem like completely at odds. Um, <laughs> we're worried about the, about the population getting fat, but we're encouraging small business that sells sugar, horrible fat, and and wheat. I don't get it. I don't understand it. We'll have a look at Australia first. Um, uh, well, Queensland, un un unfortunately, our water is contaminated and it's not contaminated by just the natural sediments that may come about from air only. It's contaminated by the government insisting on adding in things like, you know, your chlorine and adding in your fluoride as such, not in an absorbable form for our body as such. So we're going to have an accumulative effect which is going to offset our other ratios of minerals. So that's an unfavorable component. It also means you don't have a say. You, you're not entitled to be able to drink just beautiful rainwater. I know, only a couple of years ago, they were saying about, you know, we'll reimburse you if you get some water tanks in, we'll reimburse you and so forth. Okay, so many people did that. But then we got fluoride in the water. I'm sort of a bit confused. Where were you going with that? Was it another, you know, revenue that was being made? The concept of false economy comes into play. You know, is it false economics when you're saving a dollar or, you know, maybe in the case of organic produce, four or five dollars a kilo? Uh, the long term false economy involved in that may well be, you know, you end up for, uh, with, uh, you know, liver cancer from uh, years of consumption of an organophosphate with an emerging safety profile, it's not good. So we don't know that. That's not a given, I mean, there's no proof of that. But, you know, why take risks? Because we know that good food is good. We don't know that the sprayed food is necessarily good yet. Well, my cousin's uh, a large producer, or was a large producer of broccoli in this country. And he once said to me, if you knew what was in that broccoli, you wouldn't eat it. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I have sprayed that field of broccoli there three times a week, plus I put drums of chemicals into it every week, into the water I feed the broccoli. He said, um, I don't eat it myself. And I thought to myself, you know, what's happening? I know we have to feed ourselves, but you know, are we doing this the right way? You know, when you start looking at these chemicals, organophosphates and pesticides and herbicides, you know, they don't just go on the plant and, and disappear. Um, they, f they follow the food chain right to us. You know, people's exposure to food that's becoming not food. The more human beings tinker with this stuff, the more, for want of a better word, we're stuffing it up, you know. Plants know what to do. Uh, let's let them do what they do, and let's work on, you know, how we can best harness what they do for our good. Not let's tinker with them to do what we want them to do, because that's not the law of nature. We're starting to lose our connection with food and nature, and that's sad. Not everyone is, but you can see a portion of. Um, I almost call them the food underprivileged. So, you know, if your dad beats you up as a kid, you're underprivileged. If you then go and beat your kids up, that's two generations that are underprivileged. If you don't eat, you know, that's one generation that's underprivileged. If you then don't show your children how to eat, that's two. We're now seeing, you know, second generation underprivileged children. And they're underprivileged because they're not eating right. And their genes aren't giving the right messages back because they're not getting the right messages from what they eat and what they see and their environment as well. So that's very sad. I think the whole reason that we're seeing such an increase in infertility um, really goes back to poor diet choices. Fast foods and things like that or produce that has chemicals in it but also uh, if we look at things like chicken that's been pumped full of steroids and hormones these all contribute to female reproductive disorders, so we're seeing a lot higher incidence in polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, and all these sort of uh, reproductive conditions that um, contribute to infertility. So I think diet is definitely a big factor to consider um, 
when looking at a patient that has infertility. But also a lot of the times infertility is also linked to stress I and mean, there's an increased uh, stress in today's society. So by using things like flower essences and counselling techniques, if we can actually also work on the psychological aspects of fertility, so what is the metaphysical or what is the psychological blockage that's happening, this can also work in increasing fertility. With the males, uh, we want to make sure that their sperm's in optimum condition. So we need to get them on an organic diet, put them on increased fruits and vegetables. And we can certainly use things like zinc, vitamin E, for example, um, to increase the function of sperm, make sure the sperm is of good quality. And that will also assist both male and female as a couple to increase their fertility chances. We also have this obsession, we think that fat's going to make us fat, and I think that's half the problem as well. And so we're not having, we're avoiding good fats. We're avoiding good fats, and when there really isn't a very good understanding of the fact that, um, that fats can be good for you, and they are good for you, and they're important for you, and that's, you know, we need... Um, we need cholesterol to make hormones and that, um, that you know, that whole cholesterol thing is another story in itself. With cholesterol, the, what's really more important than the amount of cholesterol in your food is food which makes your body make cholesterol. So trying to differentiate that. So from that point of view, um, understanding the difference between a cholesterol lowering diet and a low cholesterol diet um, and a low cholesterol diet would be essentially what you're seeing you know the conventional concept is a, is a low cholesterol diet or a no cholesterol diet um, whereas a cholesterol lowering diet is going to um, p potentially can co include cholesterol because it's an understanding that your body is going to make cholesterol and make significant amounts of cholesterol and that the cholesterol does actually have a useful purpose. It's not, it's not the absolute enemy. It's there for a reason. It's there, part of its reason is to protect us, protect us against free radical damage. And so uh, if you are eating food which is high in free radicals, then you potentially uh, leave yourself open to making more cholesterol. And, and margarine would have to, you know, would certainly appear to be the ultimate free radical dense food. So when we talk about bad fats, these are things like your trans fats and hydrogenated fats found in your fast foods, things like your french fries, biscuits, cakes, pastries, for example and they all um, contribute to things like high cholesterol and ultimately lead to um, diabetes, cancers and cardiovascular disease. The good fats, so many diets out there are about low fat. People forget every cell in your body is made up of phospholipid lipoprotein. It's a fat component with the protein. That's our insulation, it's our protection, it's our energy source. They're taking that away, not realizing for every low fat food out there, it's being substituted with sugar because of compliancy, taste. And speaking of that with regards to taste, the more they're consuming those processed foods, the more that they are adding in the inflammatory source foods, they are literally destroying their taste buds. And look how many takeaway franchises are out there. And I know that they are truly making a conscious effort in going in the healthy direction. They could see that there's quite a few of us starting to rally and make comments and put it out in the, in, you know, to the clientele and the education that it needs to be shifted. So when you're going shopping, take the time to have a read what's really in there. Just because it says all oh, natural, just because it says no sugar added, well, Australia allows 20% sugar to be added and still say no sugar added. Yeah. You know, I, I often think it's funny when they talk about having added essential fatty acids and those sorts of things, because if you're talking about, you're talking about a powder, dried powdered product, like how rancid and damaged would those fats be? 
Um, and probiotics is another one which is just hilarious that they have you know, added, added probiotics for goodness. It's like what they, there's live bacteria in that dried powder in a tin that's been there for six months. Are you kidding me? You know, our genes don't recognise that food. For the first time in our genomic history, we're being subjected to foods that our genes don't recognise. And when our genes get messages from food that they don't recognise, they do unrecognised activities in the body. So they turn on all manner of mechanisms that are abnormal because the genes have no coping mechanism for this. It's a stressor that they've never encountered. Not like an apple. They know what an apple is and what to do with it because evolutionarily we, we you know, evolved with that food and our gene sequence evolved around that. But the game's changed, but our genes haven't changed yet. So we're in that dealing with artificial food mode where our genes are doing all kinds of weird things they've never done before and giving us things like obesity we've never seen before, ep epidemics we've never seen before of diabetes, of heart disease, of osteoporosis, of rheumatoid arthritis, the list goes on. What I personally suspect is behind that is the food we're eating. Plants were, were here on Earth millions of years before humans evolved, and the human genome evolved with plants. So we adapted to their chemicals, their properties, their vitality, and you know, each of our cells have receptors for those chemicals in plants. So we have an affinity for things in the natural world because evolutionarily, we evolved around those different kingdoms. Another example of that would be biophilia, and you know, studies into interactions with nature show that that interaction has a positive influence on the human being on a number of levels, and to discount you know, a vital force beyond the physical would be, um, I think, not giving that credence. You, you can't exclude nutrition when you're treating someone. The associations that deal with herbal medicine require a nutrition component in the course that they accredit. Yeah, well, what, what nutrition does is forms, you know, the basis of a lot of our health. And we know uh, through the work of Professor Jeffrey Bland, for instance, that nutrition, you know, directly affects gene sequencing in the body. It turns genes on or off. Um, and Professor Bland's done a lot of work with um, inflammatory nutritional genomics and found that you know, certain plants and nutrients can cause or turn down inflammation in the body. And I mean, that alone warrants further investigation. It's just a, uh, you know, a tremendous um, indicator of, of what nutrition can do in the body. And I think that's underrated by a lot of people. So yeah, healthy eating, um, is where it starts. Food, as Hippocrates said a very, very, very long time ago, thousands of years ago, food is your medicine. Fruit and vegetables contain the antioxidants that we need. They also have, the vegetables and so forth, have the fibre in them to help with the elimination, to help with the hormonal problems that we're seeing so much of at such a young age with our young boys and girls. Organic food is food that is grown, raised and um, harvested using all natural methods, so uh, using preferably species of traditional non-genetically modified, non-hybrid foods that are traditional open pollinated species, usually of plants that have been around with us for, for in some cases thousands of years, and growing those plants in soils and conditions that are not subjected to artificial fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, organophosphates, and other processing methods beyond the natural evolutionary requirements of that plant and growth requirements of that plant. And that that fruit or the, the uh, produce from that plant is then kept um, as it is grown and not subjected to any artificial applications. 
I, I think from a logical point of view, if you want to try and minimise the amount of chemicals that people have got in their body, and, and, um, and we just don't know for a lot of these things how much influence they're having, and particularly for people who are quite um, debilitated, it's quite important that having a reduced chemical load on the body can be really important. Um, and it's also the ca capacity for, for the way that they have to grow organic food, that they have to be picked riper because they're not stored in chemicals and all those sorts of things, that your capacity for high nutritional value is, is there as well. Um, but even from a more global point of view, and it's better, it's environmentally, it's a lot better. It, it respects the, the earth that it comes from. Yes, you don't get as much yield necessarily, but that's because you're yielding as much as the earth is supposed to be able to give you rather than as much as you're able to eke out of it. So um, yeah, so organic food is, is worth that. Um, it's, uh, so, and the thing is some things, it's and if, for a lot of people, but for most people, it wouldn't be actually that hard for them to grow some of their own either. It's not all about buying organic food. It's also about having a little bit of involvement from that point of view as well. You know, cherry tomatoes. There's, there's lots of books around about, you know, growing vegetables in small spaces. You know, they're set up for people who live only have a balcony, who live in a unit, and sh showing them still how they can grow a certain number of vegetables themselves that way. Organic produce um, doesn't use pesticides and chemicals. And it's this um, that actually will increase the health benefits of the foods. You're not ingesting these harmful chemicals that can cause certain um, nutritional deficiencies because they can inhibit certain nutrients in the body, but also potentially lead to various illnesses such as cancer because of the amount of chemicals um, on the food. Organic food has so much better therapeutic potential because it's put under stress when it's growing. And all the phytochemicals that it creates are created to fight off pests and fungus and, and insects and um, poor irrigation and these sorts of things. And all, all the, 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 the outcome of that is a plant that's far more robust and stronger, but also has this therapeutic potential. If you, if you take um, echinacea, for instance, which has all these sort of antibacterial qualities and antiviral qualities. If you grow it as a wild plant, it's a totally different plant to something that you would grow commercially with fertilizer and irrigation and all that sort of stuff. Because, and it doesn't have to do anything, it just has to exist. And that's true for any kind of food. If you, if you grow food that way anywhere, it doesn't have to produce all the chemicals that it not normally used to produce. And the thing is that we evolved with the plant that's grown organically or wild crafted, not the stuff that's grown commercially. So what that's doing to our bodies, I don't know. But I don't think it's a good thing. So, you know, there's certainly um, evidence that um, you know, a diet, for instance, high in fruit and vegetable consumption reduces colorectal cancer. So that has to improve um, the chances of you living longer. And that's the tip of the iceberg. You know, we're beginning now to, um, to discover that, you know, a diet high in fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and low in red meat, um, you know, contributes to lower rates of uh, many chronic diseases. So that's exciting. I would like to see um, that investigated further as well. I think that would be exciting as well. So yeah, diet is, is just underrated. Everything that our body is and does relies on nutrients and nutritional value. And if you don't have the right ingredients there, then nothing else is gonna work. So um, if you're missing the cofactor in a, in a biochemical pathway, no amount of you you stimulating that biochemical pathway, whether it be with a herb or drug or whatever, is going to replace the fact that there's a cofactor missing. And so nutrition is the foundation from a physical point of view to good health. By looking at what to incorporate in a healthy diet, you want to make sure that you have as many fruits and vegetables as possible, particularly the brighter the colour the better. We want to increase our antioxidants because these will help combat things like our free radicals. And free radicals are something that can be produced in the body on exposure to stress, pollution, certain chemicals, poor diet, for example. 
Free radicals are basically unstable electrons or unstable cells in the body and what they can do is contribute to things like premature aging, tissue damage and certain diseases such as cancer. So by eating a diet high in antioxidants, um, particularly found in your fruits, vegetables, berries, we can actually help combat and minimise these free radicals in the body. Your good fats are broken into your monounsaturated fats and your polyunsaturated fats. So examples of monounsaturated fats are things like your nuts, so your almonds, um, your walnuts, macadamia nuts for example, your avocados and olive oils. Your polyunsaturated fats are found in seafoods, so fish, salmon, uh, and in oils such as safflower oil and sunflower oil. The Mediterranean diet has been around for many, many years, has been so overly scientifically stripped and analysed and validated for its use. So what is it focused on? Well, of course, for me the most prominent thing about the Mediterranean diet is, which I love, is how important it is to love eating to enjoy eating, to be eating the meal, preferably at a table or around, you know, who you're with, family and friends and so forth, not in times of stress. Um, and that's their lifestyle. It's focused on as much variety as possible. It's not just a plate with them, it's the assortment, all the oils that are being added into their salads and so forth, the consumption of fish far more readily then of course red meat. They do include the red meat, but it's only like the once a week as such in comparison to the, to the fish consumption, a lot of legumes as well. And that's the side version of with the, the legumes because, and even though it's a component, it didn't get taught as much, but in actual fact it exists. The, you know, the, the chickpeas and the lentils in combination with your various legumes and so forth. Um, and of course the beautiful glass of red wine, that's there as an aperitif or um, as an enjoyment of a drink with, with lovely antioxidants. The Mediterranean diet is one that can be applied literally to anybody and everybody because it focuses on your complex carbs, it focuses on the nourishment of a variety of your fruit and veggies, particularly you know the, the veggies as such. The fruit initially was consumed before their meals because the fruit contain the digestive enzymes. So you'll often find with the, you know, the Mediterraneans, you know, in different to the Western world, the fruit was actually a platter that was initially placed first, right? And it provides the digestive enzymes required to start the breaking down when you, you start eating your other meals. And then later on, half an hour, an hour or so later, they're actually sitting down to their hearty meal with all the good fats in there, no holding back on that, no holding back. It's flavour, it's taste, and the herbs that they use. Not so much spices, then Mediterraneans, we're not into the spices as such in the curries, but a lot of the herbs. You'll see, you know, other than your typical parsley in there, but cardamom and coriander thrown in there, nutmeg in your various dishes, especially as far as flavouring is concerned, you know, cinnamon, of course. Yeah, so it's beautiful. Uh, there isn't one Mediterranean diet, there's probably 20 or 30, depending on which region of the Mediterranean you come from. But typically you've got a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruit, very little meat, red meat, uh, chicken, fish, a lot of fish, and uh, dairy. And whole grains, very little refined foods. The majority of the foods that are eaten are fruit and vegetables and olive oil. Olive oil figures prominently. And the meat is consumed at, on average once a month. So these are significant characteristics and most importantly, and the thing I like the best, moderate consumption of red wine. I just like to go into people's houses, open their pantry doors. I just like to walk in with a bin and just go, no, no, going, gone. No, you don't need that. Thank you. Out, out, out. And I'd like to live with them. I'd like to move in with them for a week and say, I'll do the cooking. I'll do the shopping. You're coming with me and you're watching me. I'm going to do it for a week and take that garbage out. Come on, kids, gather around. This is what we're doing. I'd love to do that. Be fun. Ha <laughs> ha
You know, you are what you eat. Yeah, it's it's so cliche, but it's true. It's just that simple. It's true. Start with food as your medicine, then see if you need some form of medicinal um, supplementation, be it herbal, nutritional, or the allopathic, because this is your way of life. This is what you need to do every day. Without that, and only relying on the medication aspect, you're never going to be in control of your own life. You're never going to empower yourself. And really the healing is not going to be fully there. It has a big role. Another radical change within the last hundred years, it's been the way in which we approach health. Modern medicine in the form of pharmaceutical drugs is today a trillion dollar a year worldwide industry. The pharmaceutical industry is, and has been for years, the most profitable of all businesses in the United States. The United States alone accounts for almost half of the global market of pharmaceutical drugs every year. Ironically, the richest country in the world, and the one that spends the most money on pharmaceutical drugs every year, is also the sickest nation on the planet. The concept of a pill for every ill and symptom suppression without addressing the root cause common of modern medicine has clearly failed to deliver a healthy society. Statistically, one out of every three people you know will die of cancer, one other will die of heart disease or diabetes, which is also quickly becoming epidemic, even on children. These non-communicable diseases were almost non-existent 100 years ago, and they still are in society secluded from the modernized world that still rely mostly on their own forms of traditional medicine and agriculture. In April 2011, the European Union passed a directive called Traditional Herbal Medicine Products Directive, effectively making illegal the use of natural medicine, including herbal medicine, Chinese traditional medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, among many others, unless they obtain a license, which in the vast majority of cases is so expensive, only pharmaceutical companies can afford. Traditional herbal medicine is highly sophisticated. It is the product of centuries of discovery, learning and refinement. However, the base for this ban is the claim that traditional medicine is non-scientific. But, is it really? Schopenhauer, I think, in the uh, 1800s, and he said that all truth passes through three stages. So, first, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, uh, it is found to be self-evident. And I think that's the type of evolution that herbal medicine, that many complementary medicines are currently going through, is that, you know, the only thing is, where are we at? Are we still in the first, the second? Are we moving into the third phase where people are starting to acknowledge it? I think to an optimist, um, they'd like to think that. I, I, you know, I'd like to think optimistically, but um, maybe to the pessimist, you know, we're only entering the first stage, that we are still being ridiculed. And, and wherever you travel around the world, there are establishments that will ridicule uh, naturopathic medicine or complementary medicine. Uh, and, in, and in truth, the only thing that's going to reveal that is time. Uh, to see where we're going. Yeah. yeah, natural medicine has been dogged by uh, a lot of myths and, um, and you know, bogus pseudoscience over the years. There's no doubt about that. And a lot of it's deservedly so. Um, but we've got to be careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater here. So when we look at natural medicine as a whole, you know, there has to be some gold and there's some fool's gold there as well. Is herbal medicine scientific or non-scientific? Well, I mean, look, that's an interesting question. When we look at the history of herbal medicine that we know of, so we can confirm through burial findings uh, that have been found in, I think it was Shandana, uh, near modern day Iraq, that human beings at that time have been using, or at least were knowledgeable about so many different types of herbal medicine. So um, 60,000 years is a long time. So looking at how that's evolved over the ages, modern science now, when we look at when modern science came about, you know, it started with the uh, Copernicus and, and finding out that, well, you know, 
we aren't the center of the universe as we had been told and then suddenly science exploded and you had you know Sir Isaac Newton all of these uh, you know boil all of these massive brains that just came to the fore and science started started running away with this newfound knowledge and newfound information and what I can do with it and I can I can find out all the mysteries of the universe all the while you know for 60,000 or 58,000 years that had all been um, herbal medicine had been naturally progressing had been naturally evolving so really when you look at things like the scientific method experimentation and, and double blind placebo controlled studies it might not have been to that standard but let's be honest that's how they did things so they would you know trial different herbs they would experiment with them on different types of things and hey if you kill the patient well i know not to use that one again but it was trial and error it was experimentation so to think that science didn't come about until the scientific revolution is nonsense and anyone that tells you this is is foolish because the same the same ideas the same concepts that we still hold dear today in the scientific model have been and you know been used all the way since uh, Aristotle since um, you know Pyth the, the Pythagoreans and and Hippocrates and all of these great minds they were scientific minds I mean it was Hippocrates that first said and separated disease from the gods he sat there and said hey it's not the gods that are striking down these plagues and afflictions on us it has to be something environmental so for him to actually reason that to use rationality to to work that out shows scientific method so is it is it uh, scientific or is it non-scientific? It's both. Herbal medicine, we're finding that nutrition and diet therapy and lifestyle interventions are gathering evidence to confirm some of their empirical usages. And that's exciting because um, there's a lot to explore here. You know, there's thousands of herbs we haven't even looked at yet. You know, we haven't found a lot of plants yet. So the natural world is probably the greatest undiscovered resource that there ever was and ever will be. And now's the time when we should be looking at that because we're going to find more. The traditional understanding is being supported by current research. That's what I think is interesting. Um, there are so many, so many times when you look at a particular herb and you start doing research on that herb um, and the research backs up the, the traditional understanding. That's the bit that's really interesting. And that's where you think, well, of course we have to listen to this traditional understanding because, you know, there's a lot of history involved in using herbs in that particular way. But then when you start doing research on it and that is that tradition is supported, well, you know, it really gives it extra credibility I suppose. You know the World Health Organization states that over 70% of the world's population, the world's population rely on herbal medicine as a primary source of healthcare. Not as a secondary, not as an adjunct, not as complementary, not as, no, 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 that's all they got. That's the only choice they've got. That's pretty profound. How can you just delete that? How can you just extirpate that? from the, you know, the histories. The simple fact is that the statistics show the truth. The truth is, is that you know, hundreds of thousands of Australians, if we're just speaking about Australia, we won't speak about the rest of the world, there's different statistics for that, but you know, hundreds of thousands of Australians, if not you know, millions, utilize complementary medicines as healthcare, as part of their healthcare regime. So why are they doing that? If it was all placebo, let's just, Imagine for a minute that it was all placebo. Do we think that we'd still and have done for the last 20 years have increasing and escalating amounts of usage? Unlikely, I think. I think that's highly unlikely. Science is wonderful. I love science. It has this ability to reveal the deepest inner secrets about a subject. And I think that's fascinating. But the problem with science is that it has these blinkers on. So it can sit there and scrutinize to the most amazing detail, every single little thing about a particular topic. I mean, look at modern medicine, for example. There's not one person or one physician that can treat everything. Suddenly there's specialists in everything. So you've got gastroenterologists, ear, nose, throat surgeons, cardiothoracic surgeons, each just involved with this small little piece of the larger puzzle. 
And that's representative of science. It can, it can put under its microscope this, this amazing gaze, this penetrate, penetrating gaze to extract all of the information out of a given subject. But the biggest problem is with those blinkers, it doesn't have the big picture. And so when you look at the traditional concepts, the, these philosophical concepts that herbal medicine, that a lot of the complementary therapies have come from, that has been evolving over time, they look at things with the big picture. They look at how something affects the entire body, not just a part of it. And that's something that gives me hope because if we can harness this amazing power that science currently has, and this technology is just gonna to continue to evolve, it's gonna to continue to get more powerful, we're gonna to continue to get a more profound understanding of the human body and how we fit into the universe. But if we don't ask the bigger questions, if we can't sit back and look at things in totality, then it's all for naught. So herbal medicine, um, I think out of all of the complementary medicines, um, is probably one of the one that's most studied. So when we look at uh, things like uh, a lot of the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled studies done on ginkgo biloba that have been done on St. John's wort, there's a lot of herbal medicines that, have, that actually have scientifically proven um, evidence to show that they work for a myriad of conditions. So the question then is, you know, are we trying to fit the round peg in the square hole, which is how I think we are sometimes. We're trying to make these, these plants, these, these herbal medicines that are completely complex, they are so much more complex uh, chemically um, than their pharmaceutical cousins. Um, that we're trying to push them into this model to work and they don't fit. So you're looking at some herbs that have, you know, 60, 70, 100, 200 different phytochemicals in varying concentrations. And science is sitting there making us pick, well, what's the one ingredient that does it? Now, for some herbs that might work, but for others it won't. And it's the relationship that they have, that synergy together, that actually is the medicine. It's that, it's that, variability that they have that is the medicine and I think that you know it's it's wonderful to sit there and try and look at isolated constituents and things like that but that detracts from what herbal medicine is because when we go back to that discussion about vitality about vital force you can't find vitality in a panadine fort you can't find vitality in in a Prozac tablet when you look at modern medicine modern medicine evolved from us that's the truth. Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine? Well, not really. He was a herbalist. He used simple tools. He used and understood the vital force. He knew uh, simple things about hygiene. He was just as much a part of complementary therapy or natural medicine as he is to uh, the modern medical practice. So I really think that, you know, in, 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 in summary at looking at that, we have to look at integrating. We have to look at taking the best of both and using that for your patient's well-being. Because really, at the end of the day, it's not about, I'm better than you. It's not about, we're more advanced. It's gotta be about patient outcomes. It's gotta be about health. It's gotta be about getting your patient healthy again. And what is health? It's not just an absence of disease. It's about that vitality, about emotional well-being, about all these things, which I know and have seen after years of practice work on people. So. You know, I think modern medicine has a way still to go. I think that modern medicine is something we can't do without. But I think modern medicine forgets whose shoulders it stands on. These kind of modern medicines, as people um, identify uh, with, have side effects, unfortunately. Yes, there is a place for them. I will say, and I'm comfortable to say, because we need to use modern medicine for emergencies, for that quick first aid. We need to have that. We need our intensive care units at the hospitals. It's fabulous. They, this is where I believe we can work together. We are seeing more and more, and doctors are saying that. The ABC Health Report actually did um, a massive interview with a collective group of um, doctors. They also did um, a survey with regards to it. And they were the ones who actually came out with, with the um, overall conclusion and, and they, they defined it as postmodern 
postmodern views and that was how clients are so dissatisfied uh, the adverse effects that they were getting from modern modern medicine that it wasn't the magic bullet that everybody claimed it would be yeah and the ongoing different diseases that were coming about from modern medicine you know these side effects and you often see it you have a client I have a client here who initially started off with one form of medication I'll, I'll pick on statins for example used extensively for lowering cholesterol levels well the compromise of that is it depletes coenzyme Q10 now that is such an important component of nutrient as such for every cell in the body and what do they end up experiencing initially anything from oozing out wax excessively from the ear to aches and pains and then muscle wastage so of course then they've got to come in and try and address that if it's possible for them to be addressed well for us we say if you're being depleted on that, let's provide it, coenzyme Q10 as such. So modern medicine may be available and people may wonder why we would be wanting natural medicine such, because of adverse effects, because it's not the magic bullet as it was promised initially. And from these adverse effects, we have that next disease that comes about or the next condition or the side effect that causes so much deterioration um, to these poor clients. Allopathic medicine and natural medicine as such can work beautifully together. They both have a place for our planet here. They, they, that's why they've come into existence. They just need to fine tune so that there's no ownership of the client because that's really where the problem begins and ends. It's where one feels they own the client and their medicine is the only medicine and the other's feeling the same. That's not the way it should be because no one owns the client, no one cures the client. The client cures themselves. All we do is facilitate the healing journey. We dossier, we educate them, we empower them, and then they choose. And if they wish to combine the two together, if it's necessary, that's still their choice. We're not here to say, because this is modern medicine, the synthetic, da da da, it's wrong. That's not going to empower the client. They need to experience that, that's their journey. But working together, it can be done. And it is being done. We have lots of lovely integrative doctors out there who are prepared to do it. I can't see a situation where it needs to be us and them. I think that we can sit side by side very nicely. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's so many areas where you know, someone can be on conventional treatment uh, and we can support them. We can support that treatment. Uh, certainly there's no need to say, you know, oh, well, you can't see me because you're taking a certain medication or, you know, whatever. That's, that's completely, com to me, that's actually quite, you know, strange that you would see that, see it that way. Uh, to me, I think that the, the combination is potentially very good. Um, and I've certainly seen that work rather well in clients where someone may be on a, uh, a pharmaceutical medication, which is you know, very narrow in its action, and then you can support it with, um, with herbal medicine to support what's happening around that um, and mitigate the side effects. That, that's what I, where I think the combination can work particularly well, and I think it's an area that we really haven't, um, that we haven't investigated particularly much. Uh, but it's a particular interest to me is how herbal medicine and naturopathy can mitigate the side effects of conventional medicine um, mm -hmm. without saying that you shouldn't be having the conventional medicine because quite often it's, it's incredibly necessary. But often it also has side effects and they're something that we can deal with quite often if you know what you're doing with the medication. So for example, if we look at HIV and AIDS, um, we can assist these patients whilst they're on their, their drugs or their pharmaceutical medications. So a lot of these patients take antiretroviral drugs, which are very important. Um, however, they have very um, detrimental side effects. And this is where naturopathy can come into it because we can actually support and assist these people um, with these side effects. Anyone that thinks they got all the answers, any modality that thinks they got all the answers is arrogant and there's no place for arrogance in healthcare, I really think. 
So that communication has got to be opened up. It's communication that's stifling us at the moment. You know, it's he said, she said, uh, you know, it's them and us. It's, it doesn't have to be that way. At the end of the day, what do we want? You know, what is healthcare about? About curing the sick. It's about helping the sick. And that's what it's got to be about. We've forgotten about all this. Why? Because, you know, other interests, corporate interests, whatever the case may be, who cares? We have to stop that. We have to bring it back to helping that person. And if I can get that help through a GP and a surgeon and, and, and a, a multiple other uh, modalities and, and clinical practitioners, then why not? Why isn't that? That's perfect to me that I can be pulling on a much wider spectrum of knowledge whereby um, you, know, you might go and see GPs or specialists for certain conditions that you require it, but um, use complementary therapists for preventative health. I mean, think about that for just 10 seconds. If we could stop a person from having congestive heart failure, which is one of the most common conditions uh, in Western society, if we could stop that progression for maybe five years, if we could give them an extra five years of good quality of life before they started to fall into the, uh, the, the later stages of these conditions, don't only think about the human cost there, because that's profound, to sit there and give someone an extra five years of a, a generally well and healthy life. That's amazing, it's profound. Think about the savings to the healthcare system. That's five years that that person is not uh, taxing the, the already uh, overly taxed uh, health, health uh, system that we have here in Australia. I think that that complementary medicine with, with chronic disease, as I previously said, but in, in this area of preventative health, is absolutely crucial. Maybe have us as the first port of call so that we can sit there, take an hour and a half to take a case, do all the tests that I need to do. And hey, I mean, I do it now in clinical practice. If I hear something that sounds funny, I could be listening to someone's heart. I'm not a cardiologist, I don't pretend to be, but I know what sounds wrong and I can refer them away. And then that, you know, that, that patient's care has gone over to someone else who's an expert in that field. I think prevention is really where we are going to have the most lasting impact on healthcare. Um, and I think you know, through integration we can achieve that, but the prevention concept has got to be touted as being extremely important. I think the savings to Australia's healthcare system um, would be profound. Modern medicine's done a lot of good things. You know, we can thank it for uh, where we are today. However, Let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater here. Um, let's use the best of all medicines we have. And I think um, modern medicine, you know, is something we can draw on when we need it. And I think natural medicine's something we need to draw on every day because we don't want to need Western medicine. Herbalists use, you know, safe medications. So we only select herbs that have been um, shown to be safe. So I think that's important. Um, when treating people. Um, the other benefits of herbal medicine are, you know, herbal medicine, it acts slowly but surely. It has a gradual, gentle, usually a, a gradual, gentle onset of action, and it seems to fire the mechanisms of vitality and homeostasis within people um, gently. So I think that's a great benefit, particularly when you're dealing with giving the medicines to children, elderly people, and chronically ill people who are devitalized. Yeah, many people are using both um, natural medicines and Western medicines together. I think people get help wherever they can. And um, most of the time, we find that overwhelmingly natural medicines don't adversely affect Western medicines. There are exceptions to that, but you know, a properly trained herbalist or nutritionist or um, naturopath will know about those indications and avoid using certain remedies for certain patients who are on certain Western medicines. This is lemon balm. And if you read uh, Thomas Bartram's Encyclopedia of Herbal Medicine, he refers to lemon balm as being sovereign for the brain. So it's a specific herb that you can have as a tea or as a tincture and it helps cognitive function and circulation. Um, and lemon balm is also a nice mild sedative on the nervous system. So you can use it wherever someone's anxious, 
and needs a lift with study or memory or retention of information. It, it's just lovely added to salads and it's lovely as a tea. I guess a naturopath in, in terms of what's current, the current training of naturopathy is, um, and we, we talk about the uh, bachelor level of qualification, incorporates, they are trained as a health practitioner. So they're trained in clinical medicine, disease, differential diagnosis, um, anatomy and physiology, and all the fundamental basics required for them to be able to competently work with people in a health related area. So that's the sort of the fundamental underpinning which of, of naturopathy. And then as part of that, the tools that then that are utilised in terms of managing all of that underpinning knowledge is there's a couple of major modalities that are included in herbal medicine and nutritional medicine as part of that. Um, and beyond that, there are some other diagnostic tools that people can use, such as iridology. Um, there's also some working from an, an emotional counselling point of view and how to manage lifestyle. Um, sides of things. In terms of nutrition, there's two aspects of that. There's orthomolecular nutrition, which is the use of supplements um, when necessary and how to identify when they're necessary and how to prescribe them appropriately. And there's also dietary changes and how to manage the diet, um, dietary imbalances and those sorts of things. And also from a nutritional point of view, beyond the specific nutrients is understanding that concept of food as medicine, understanding the physiological activity of certain active ingredients in foods such as um, broccoli and cabbage and you know it even some herb herbs that can be taken as a um, as a supplement but also are commonly included in foods such as garlic and turmeric and and sage and basil and those sorts of things and understanding what those things are so the the knowledge all of that under uh, knowledge are all kind of tools in the tool belt of naturopathy but it's built upon this underpinning foundation of understanding human body, human physiology and those sorts of things as well. What is someone going to find when they go and see a naturopath? I think they're going to find someone, number one, and most importantly, that is genuinely concerned about, uh, about their health, that's going to do everything they can to try and get to the bottom of it, that has a lot of tools at their disposal to try and find out what's going on, and that knows their limitations. So if, if you go and see a naturopath that's you know, that's suitably trained, don't think that if there is something more serious that they might let it go. I mean, most naturopaths are well trained enough now that they're going to be able to identify when something's more serious and it needs to be referred away. So then, you know, you can, you can go to the surgeon or doctor or whatever the case might, might be to help that case progress. But you're going to find someone that's genuinely caring that's going to take the time um, to get to the bottom of things. I mean, my first consult's between an hour and a half and two hours. I've got a lot of time, I can ask a lot of questions. I can get to know you. Um, I can build rapport. I think that's really important. How can you build rapport in 15 minutes? You can't. Again, why I feel so sorry for our, for our medical brethren. Um, they, uh, they don't have the ability to work as I do. And I feel sorry for them for that because of the system, not because of them. They want that, but it's the system that's failing them. And I think for me, if I want to take an hour and a half, two hours, I want to take three hours. I can do whatever I want. Um, and that's the, the beauty of it. So I can really take that time to get to know the patient, get to understand the case, um, to do all the tests that I want to get done, um, but to get to know the person. I mean, you're not just a body, you're not just a bunch of symptoms and signs to get to know you. You know, I can work out from, you know, in 15 minutes, you can't work out that much, but after, you know, two hours and, and sitting there and watching someone being really fidgety, I can get a pretty good idea that you're pretty anxious or that you're highly strung. And does that change the way that I might prescribe for that patient, maybe? So I think that um, apart from that education, you're going to get me that's going to sit there or any naturopath and herbalist that's going to sit there and say, look, it's not just about taking these. It's about all of these dietary modifications or you need to start eating more of this. You might want to stop eating a little bit of that. You need to get more exercise. Maybe go and do some yoga, relax. You know, there's so many different modalities that a naturopath uh, can draw upon to help bring about health. You know, I don't say cure, you know, I, I don't like that word. To just restore health, that's really what it's about. Health, dis-ease, a lack of ease in the system, I'm restoring that balance. And, and if that balance comes from herbs, great. Vitamins, great. Whatever, what, whatever the need is, but you're going to get someone that will work with you, not tell you what to do. Examples I have of that is, is a, a woman who came to see me for some dietary advice and over two or three consultations, I 
just did what I normally do, gave her lots of information and, and she sort of went away for three or four months and then came back at the beginning of a new season, says, oh, you know, I eat different in summer than winter. So I wanted to do a summer diet up, but she'd written it all out and she had her full structured summer diet of exactly what it is that she had. And it was great. And it, incorp it incorporated all of the information that I'd given her over time. And she'd taken it on her own, within her own power to actually make those changes herself. And that was a really great thing for me. And we made a few minor changes, but mostly it was just, she, I was just kind of that feeling of my work here is done. And, you know, making yourself redundant by giving them enough information to be able to mostly look after the, the, their own health and, you know, come to you when they need further information and further advice, but mostly looking after their own health. And this is the part that I find really touches my, my, the clients and it touches many clients who go and see naturopaths because they've never been given the opportunity to say, how does that make you feel? What are your thoughts on your condition? What do you think is happening with you? How do you, can you make the connection of when this started? They've never been asked that by all the specialists that's out there. It's, everything is based on pathology test, which yes, I do use because again, I need to find out the physical body what's happening. Or it's been based on ultrasounds or x-rays or CT scans or MRIs. But nobody's actually asked their heart, their mind, right? How are you feeling? How do you uh, feel that you could um, take this? You know, are you ready to literally just surrender to it and go, okay, this is it. They said I have two years. Oh, well, you know, I might as well keep drinking it. Or are you gonna go, no, I've got so much to live for. So when I'm looking at, let's say for example, we're treating a condition, um, we look at psoriasis. I explain the physiological aspect, the patho, the reasoning, the deficiencies, the treatment. Say, okay, now have a think about it. What's in their mind? What is happening in their heart? Why would the largest organ, the skin, be riddled with such an appearance? You know, what's actually happening? What are they feeling about themselves? Are they really that repulsed about who they are? Because that's the message that they're giving themselves. And you keep feeding every cell in your body that kind of negative thought, it manifests. The whole um, concept though of taking the pill for something like skin issues, usually this is the first suggestion that a GP will give. They don't actually look into what the underlying cause of these skin issues is. If it's something like stress, then we can use our herbs, vitamins, minerals, homeopathy, etc. Same, usually um, it's around puberty, so it's, a, it's all about hormonal imbalances. And once again, our natural remedies can really help to stabilize and normalize hormones so we have a vast array um, at our disposal that we can use and they don't come with the side effects that the OCP will have um, the same with helping to uh, reduce things like menorrhagia or metorrhagia or heavy periods and painful periods we have a lot of um, herbal remedies specifically that will actually help to treat the pain and reduce the amount or blood flow and blood loss and so we can actually take the person off OCP or at least reduce the dosage so they're not getting the side effects that they would on the OCP. Well first do no harm it's actually quite it's that's actually it's not specific to naturopathy first do no harm is one of the precepts for a lot of other health professionals as well and but it's the way that we interpret it is quite different as well so first do no harm of course starting point means if something is might hurt then don't do it and that's kind of the, the starting point but the interpretation of what might hurt can be a bit different from naturopathy so from our point of view suppressing something is also considered a bit of doing harm so if someone comes in with a rash then for you for a naturopath to prescribe a cream for the rash and not address anything that's happening internally that might be causing the rash is not considered good practice and would be construed as doing harm because you're actually suppressing a symptom that that when there's an internal problem that needs to be fixed in some way so that's that the first do no harm as i said it's not unique to naturopathy but our interpretation of it is quite is unique to our worldview, i guess um our, our view of the body and health and all those kinds of things i mean i love the old adage that the the chinese the ancient chinese physicians that used to work for the you know the rich and powerful royal households 
they only got paid when the family was healthy. I love that idea. Imagine, you know, if you only got paid because you were doing a good job, not because you were sick. They would, as soon as someone got sick in the household, payment would stop. So you had to make sure everyone was healthy because um, that is the sign that you are what? A good physician. You're a good clinician because you're keeping everyone in health. And that really is, I think, the secret is, is returning to health and then staying healthy. Um, and it's not that hard, you know, it's, it's just about getting to understand your body, uh, getting to, to understand the feelings and, and uh, um, getting in touch with yourself and, and taking an active role. Do not give, you know, someone power over you. It is so disempowering. It's, it's about, I want to get active. I want to take a role in my own health. I want to, I want to ask questions. I'm going to research, I'm going to look at all these things and I'm going to make a decision and I'm going to progress that way. And if that's with a herbalist or a naturopath or a GP, then, then who cares as long as you're empowered to make that right decision and, and move forward. And heck, if you take that decision and it doesn't work out for you, you can always go another way. You have nothing to lose and only everything to gain. So I think that's the, that's the secret is don't be afraid. Uh, it's not a leap of faith, you know, you're not going to have um, you know, what people might think of, of, of naturopaths or herbalists and voodoo and all this kind of weird stuff. It's got nothing to do with that. It is, uh, there's a lot of science in it. Uh, I would say uh, in some cases now there's a lot of science uh, in, in naturopathy. There's numerous amounts of clinical uh, data to back that up, uh, to back up the use of herbal medicines, to back up the use of nutrients. Uh, science is well proven. So take a chance, you know, and, and come and try and experience the difference. There is a lot of evidence for things we do. The clinical naturopathy text that was recently published in 2010, I mean, that text is significant evidence of the body of evidence there is to support what we do. That text is over 4,000 references. Um, you know, I wrote three chapters in there and those chapters, each of those chapters has got about 200 references each. So when you look at it and you think of it like that, there's plenty of evidence out there. And I, I, I remember clearly at a, a conference, I think about two years ago, um, that um, I think it was Lesby, Leslie Braun was presenting at, and, and she made the point that, you know, for someone to say that there isn't evidence supporting what we do, um, you either have to be um, not looking or you don't want to look because it is there. You know, when you see something work and you hear sick people telling you they feel better and you look at the empirical usage of the plant and you know that you've used that plant and that that's the only X factor involved in where the person was and where the person is now, then it's quite, it makes a quite a powerful impact on you and, you know, it drives that fascination. Usually the people that go to see a naturopath are the ones that have already visited a GP. Um, and quite often they've been on a journey already with mainstream medicine. They've seen um, general practitioners, they've seen specialists and they get to the point where they're completely frustrated because either they're not being listened to, then their stories aren't being heard, um, they're not being fixed or they're taking this huge amount of medications to treat one condition that then gives them side effects or creates another condition. So. I often find that by the time they come to see a naturopath, they're quite willing because they're quite um, frustrated and they're to the point where um, they don't know what else to do. So I would definitely urge anybody that feels in this situation to explore other options. That could be a naturopath, a herbalist, a homeopath, um, any, any type of natural medicine modality because at the end of the day, you're just giving yourself an extra chance to um, to provide yourself with maximum health, which is what we all deserve. So I, I can't think of a group <clears throat> that would not benefit from, from naturopathy or, or herbal medicine. Really, I mean, everyone can. Uh, I, it would be very hard to see, uh, to consider that there's a group that wouldn't benefit. Um, it's just in benefiting in what way? I guess going to a naturopath, there is you don't have to be sick to benefit, which is a starting point. 
Um, I often say that, that naturopaths make the best hypochondriacs because it doesn't take much, of, much illness at all for a naturopath to feel like something needs to be done. But if you really want to achieve full wellness, then, then naturopathy is, is, is a benefit. And from that point of view, it doesn't matter what condition you've got at all um, or what, what diseases your body is faced with, there's always something that a naturopath can do to assist. Naturopathy is a whole process. It's a process. It's not one medication. Same as herbal medicine is not one medication. It's really a process. If they, you know, want, oh, you know, what can I take for this? It's like, sorry, you know, you need to come and see me. You need to see me or a colleague. You know, that's not my job to give you a five second consultation in the tea room and say, take this. And then, you know, you take, you know, two tablets of it and it doesn't work. And, you know, you don't do anything else. And then you say, well, it doesn't work. Well, that doesn't do naturopathy any good you know, because it's all this half-hearted stuff going on and it isn't how naturopathy works. So to do it like that, I think, would be doing naturopathy an incredible dis disservice. Um, be doing naturopathy a disservice, but doing yourself a disservice and doing the, the person a disservice because they're not getting a naturopathic consultation. They might think they are getting something for free, they're really not getting anything. It's like a, a, a renaissance, if you will. It's we're, we're coming back into into flavour at the moment, where everyone has uh, a naturopath uh, or, or a nutritionist or a, um, you know, a herbalist as, as as part of their uh, healthcare regime. I think that's important. Uh, I think that it's only going to become more so. And I would like to think that in the next twenty years, that integrative model will be evolving. I'd like to think that. Uh, we're going to start putting better foods into our hospitals uh, because God knows you can't get better from eating some of that stuff. Get some, some food, you know, like mum cooks when you're sick. That's the stuff I want to eat when I get sick, not this cardboard that you give me. You know, give, bring me into, bring, bring uh, nutritionists, bring uh, herbalists into the hospital uh, uh, system. So that's what fascinates me about it. It's the, dis the rediscovery of uh, medicines that we've always been connected to. Um, yet we've lost that connection by and large recently and um, you know, I'd like to be a part of that reconnection in some way. Because it's, you know, there's a whole pharmacopoeia of herbs here that most people don't know about. The average person living in suburbia does not know that there are, you know, trained people who have 250 herbs in a cupboard that they can talk about that can help them. So I just find that phenomenal that, you know, as an intelligent uh, bunch of human beings living in a, you know, an information world, we've overlooked this crucial little piece of medical information and this little modality that's you know, been around for thousands of years um, and isn't being utilised as it could be now. It's a great shame. What did I say is the most important thing about healthcare? Patient outcomes, patient health, the return of that patient to good health. So the role of exercise and the role of meditation is like the yin and yang, they're inseparable. They really need to be a part of your everyday life. And in that, I'm going to add another one, Carlos, and it's called recreation. You've got to play, exercise and do the meditation. My form of meditation every day is when I walk on the ocean. All right? Some people will go, oh, but you're not sitting down, you know, you're not doing the pose and everything. I, I'll do that at times when I want to. You know, I generally do it as a part of a ritual for me. But it's actually being out there, being on the ocean, walking up and down, you know, enjoying the sunshine. And I tune in and I go, shit, I'm not thinking of anything. Oh yeah, it's my meditations kicking in. And allow. Exercise, I'm already incorporating it in there. Every day, there's gotta be some form of a physical activity that they enjoy. And play? Well, you got to play. you got to bring the little child out. you got to laugh. you get, you got to have some fun. Life is becoming so serious for so many people that, you know, they're actually... You can see the indentations in them. You can see the hunching over. 
No, when was the last time people actually walked barefoot in the grass and got bindies in them? Oh, I'm still trying to remove mine of mine now. You know, just, just have fun. Get on a swing. Become a child. That is medicine for the body. That is medicine for the mind and that is medicine for the soul.